गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू ग्रेविटास एम पलकी शर्मा उपाध्याय लेट्स गेट स्टार्ट India is recording fewer cases. India is also administering more vaccines. The idea is to crush the second wave and prevent a third one. The key to achieving it is getting more vaccines. So what is the government doing for this? It is talking to more vaccine makers, making exceptions for some to get their shots. One of them, one of these major exceptions, is indemnity against legal liabilities, meaning if vaccines cause side effects, vaccine makers cannot be sued in India. Now, this privilege may be extended to Pfizer and Moderna. Desperate times, desperate measures, call it what you, what you will, but the government is seriously considering this indemnity clause. So what happens next? Other vaccine makers want the same cushion. What will the government do? They're yet to spell it out. Why are they so hard-pressed? Because the world over, rich countries have locked up all vaccines. There aren't enough to go around. More than 6 billion shots have been locked up with contracts till 2023. On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you what we've been telling you for a while now. Vaccine hoarding is a recipe for disaster. It will make sure the pandemic never really goes away. We'll explain that also on the show tonight. China's President Xi Jinping wants an image makeover. He wants the world to see his country as lovable and friendly. But what is he doing to achieve it? We'll discuss. India's battle against tech giants continues as the government tries to stop WhatsApp notifications to users. We'll also tell you why Twitter has deleted the Nigerian president's post. In America, the police is engaged in a shootout with a 12 and a 14-year-old. How did things come to such a pass? Blame America's gun epidemic and the lack of political will to stop it. And how much should you push your children? At what point does encouragement become abuse? We'll show you two videos on how much is too much. We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. With 50 days to go for the event, Tokyo 2020 President Seiko Hashimoto says the games would be held as planned unless the pandemic stops a majority of teams from traveling. This even as organizers revealed that 10,000 volunteers had quit over COVID-19 concerns and scheduling issues. Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid informed the country's president that he has reached agreements with political allies to form a new coalition government. Lapid of the centrist Yesh Atid party reached the deal shortly before the deadline, bringing an end to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's 12-year rule. The White House says that President Joe Biden will be discussing the threat posed by ransomware attacks and the issue of harboring hackers with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, this month. Biden and Putin will meet in Geneva on June 16th. After high tensions between the two sides earlier this year due to disagreements on human rights and more. The U.S. government is suspending punitive tariffs on India, Britain and four European nations for six months. This as the U.S. works to resolve a dispute over digital services taxes. The decision comes at the conclusion of a year-long probe into taxes that Washington says discriminated against U.S. tech giants like Apple, Google, Amazon and Facebook. France will start vaccinating teenagers from age 12 with the Pfizer-BioNTech jab from June 15th in a move to avoid school closures in the new academic year. This as the number of new COVID-19 cases in France dropped below 10,000 for the second day in a row and the daily death toll dropped sharply from last week, easing pressure on hospitals.
Sri Lanka is bracing for the possibility of an oil spill after the Singapore-registered MV Express Pearl sank off its western coast. The ship caught fire on May 20th while it was carrying 25 tons of nitric acid along with other chemicals and cosmetics. Emergency crews took more than two weeks to douse the flames. A study has found that increased evening screen time during the pandemic has negatively affected the sleep quality of people. Published in the journal Sleep, Italian researchers found that during Italy's first national lockdown, the daily internet traffic volume almost doubled compared to the previous year. According to a new study, oxygen levels have dropped in hundreds of lakes in the United States and Europe over the last four decades. The authors say that declining oxygen could lead to increased fish kills, algal blooms and methane emissions. Published in the journal Nature, the study found dissolved oxygen fell 5.5% in surface waters of lakes. The women's draw at the French Open has been thrown wide open with world number one and title favorite Ashley Barty exiting in the second round. The 2019 champion had scraped through her opener despite a hip injury, but things got worse against Poland's Magda Linette today. A lengthy medical timeout after the first set did not help and a heartbroken Barty was forced to retire while trailing 1-6-2-2. The Philadelphia 76ers are through to the NBA Eastern Conference semifinals after a 4-1 series win over the Washington Wizards. Despite being without injured talisman Joel Embiid, the Sixers cruise to a 129-112 win in Game 5. They will now face the Atlanta Hawks, who completed a 4-1 triumph over New York Knicks. Western Conference top seeds Utah Jazz are also through to the semis after dispatching the Memphis Grizzlies for one. India's second wave is on the decline. The numbers are steadily falling. On Wednesday, more than 134,000 new infections were recorded. For 10 days now, India's positivity rate has remained below 10%. Active cases dropped by more than 80,000. They remain around 1.7 million. India's recovery rate is now well over 92%. More than 200,000 people recovered on Wednesday. So far, more than 26 million people have recovered in India. Fatalities dropped below the 3,000 mark, which is also a good sign. The focus now is on getting more vaccines. And India has sealed a new deal for these shots. 300 million doses of Biological E. What is Biological E? It's another Made in India vaccine. It is still undergoing trials. The government will procure 300 million doses for more than $200 million. The government is also going out of its way to get Pfizer and Moderna to India. It is making major exceptions for these vaccine makers, including indemnity against legal liabilities, meaning the government of India will give them legal immunity from potential cases in this country. So if their vaccines have any side effects in India, these companies cannot be taken to court. And it's a big shift. The government has not officially announced it, but other vaccine makers are already demanding the same legal immunity. The Serum Institute is among them. The Serum Institute of India reports say that it has demanded the same indemnity, the same privileges for domestic manufacturers that Pfizer and Moderna could be given. Now, so far, India has not given such legal immunity to any vaccine maker, so this will be a first. Ensuring a level playing field will be a challenge. Getting vaccines on priority is proving to be an even bigger challenge. Rich countries still refuse to share doses. They're hoarding most of the vaccines produced so far. More than two dozen rich countries have bought six billion doses and boosters. They have locked up these shots till 2023. The European Union has struck a deal with Pfizer. They're buying up up to 1.8 billion doses of Pfizer's Wuhan virus shot. Canada is getting 125 million more doses of the same vaccine. Australia, Switzerland, Israel, they've all secured a regular supply of Moderna shots. Switzerland has an option to buy more in 2023. What about the United States? The U.S. has the option to get more than 1 billion doses from different vaccine makers. 
These are potential doses. What does that mean? It means that countries like America have an advanced contract with vaccine makers in case there's a shortage. These countries can demand more shots from pharma companies and because of their contracts, the pharma companies will have to serve these countries first. That's because they've already placed their orders. This is how the developed world is controlling vaccine supplies. They're buying up doses even before they're made. In contrast, the developing world is still waiting for vaccines. Only 85% of all, nearly 85% rather, of all vaccines administered so far have gone to people in rich countries. The world's poorest countries have got only 0.3% of all the shots. Hoarding by the developed world is pushing this pandemic towards an endemic, a situation where the Wuhan virus never really goes away. And just a short while back, the White House has also announced that it will give 7 million doses to Asian nations. This list includes more than 10 South and Southeast Asian countries, including India. So more than 10 countries will share 7 million doses. But like we told you, America is still, still sitting on a stockpile of well over 1 billion doses. So this gift of 7 million is just a drop in the ocean, a welcome drop nonetheless. Meanwhile, China gave the world this virus. Rich countries are making sure it stays. What is China doing in the meantime? After hurling insults for months, Xi Jinping wants his diplomats to dial down the aggression. He wants them to present a quote-unquote lovable China. This week, the Chinese president delivered a speech, a speech that recognized that China has an image problem. So does Xi Jinping want the diplomats to extend a hand of, hand of friendship to the world, or will the wolf warriors continue to howl in sheep's clothing? Our next report tells you more. Xi Jinping wants to give China an image makeover. On Monday, the Chinese president asked senior leaders to rebuild China's global reputation. He wants China to be seen as trustworthy, lovable and respectable. He should tell that to China's wolf warriors. Those brash and hyper-aggressive diplomats named after a series of nationalistic Chinese action films. Wolf warrior diplomats were considered a reflection of a combative China under Xi Jinping. A marked shift from the Deng Xiaoping era. Deng emphasized on hiding China's strength, working behind the scenes, avoiding controversy and sticking with rhetoric in international cooperation. But after 2017, Xi Jinping pushed for a new brand of diplomacy where diplomats denounce any criticism of China in public. Brash responses and hostile language became common. Researchers see a marked shift in speeches from China's foreign ministry over the last 20 years. Before 2012, not more than 10% of the speeches were combative and hostile. But in 2019 and 2020, more than 25% of the statements were hostile. In China, these wolf warriors became popular. Outside China, they became a liability for their government. Last year, Pew Research Center conducted a survey on China's reputation. A majority of respondents in 14 countries saw China in a negative light. Are wolf warriors alone to blame? They are, after all, only defending their government's unfriendly actions. Since the pandemic began, China has sold substandard medical supplies, hidden the origin of the virus, subjected Uyghurs in Xinjiang to a genocide, attacked the sovereignty of neighbors like India, and claimed territories of other countries in the South China Sea. Xi Jinping's actions were hardly lovable and friendly. His confrontational diplomats only made things worse. Leading the pack is this man, Zhao Lijian, often called the Wolf Warrior-in-Chief. Zhao shot to prominence in 2019 for alleging racial segregation in Washington. The world criticized Zhao's tweets, but China awarded him with a promotion. 
Zhao was made a spokesperson of the Chinese Foreign Ministry. Other Chinese diplomats started to mirror him, including those at the top. In May, when China faced sanctions from Europe over the crackdown on Uyghurs, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi launched a scathing attack. At an event, he commented, our European friends know what is genocide. In March, top American and Chinese officials clashed in public at the first high-level meeting under the new Biden administration in Alaska. When the Americans said China's actions threatened global stability, China responded with a 16-minute long tirade. A confident country is able to look hard at its own shortcomings and constantly seek to improve. The United States does not have the qualification to say that it wants to speak to China from a position of strength. Now the president wants an image makeover. Will his team change tactics? They don't seem to have got the memo. Look at what happened on Wednesday. Another Chinese diplomat pushing fake conspiracy theories. Here's some unsolicited advice for Xi and team. You don't win friends by presidential diktats. You must mend your ways. A good place to start would be to disclose the origin of the pandemic. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Back in India, tech giants continue to lock horns with the government. Yesterday, we told you how Google had challenged India's IT rules. Now, WhatsApp has refused to alter its privacy policy. Those of you watching us from India would be aware that WhatsApp is trying to update its terms of service. It wants to share your data with its parent company, Facebook. And I'm sure all of you have been receiving notifications for this. Now, the government of India has been trying to stop WhatsApp from doing this. India also passed new laws to rein in tech companies. In response, WhatsApp took the government to court. It filed a lawsuit seeking to block new regulations. It said India's new rules are a violation of privacy rights. Its own murky policy on privacy notwithstanding. On Thursday afternoon, the matter reached the Delhi High Court. The government of India urged the court to issue an interim order, an order to stop WhatsApp from sending any more notifications. The government said... And I'm quoting here, WhatsApp is indulging in anti-user practices by obtaining trick consent from users for its updated privacy policy. It further added that millions of WhatsApp users who have not accepted the privacy policy are being bombarded with notifications on everyday basis. These notifications are against the very grain of prima facie opinion of the Competition Commission of India's order. How did WhatsApp respond? Here's a statement we received from their spokesperson. The recent update does not change the privacy of people's personal messages. Its purpose is to provide additional information about how people can interact with businesses if they choose to do so. We will not limit the functionality of how WhatsApp works in the coming weeks. Instead, we will continue to remind users from time to time about the update. That's exactly what the government has an issue with. These repeated notifications might trick the user to accept WhatsApp's new policy. Now, what happens if you accept the new policy? You're technically making your life an open book on the Internet, letting WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram collectively influence what you buy, where you eat, how you travel, what you post and perhaps even how you vote. And we've discussed this in detail on the show. Also, do these rules apply to everybody? Look at this map. The answer is yes if you live in the countries marked in yellow. These rules apply to you. And no if you live in countries marked in red. Why are these countries exempted? These countries have what's called the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. It's a law to protect the data of their people. 80 countries are said to have such a law. India is not one of them.
In February, India unveiled new IT laws. And now there's a pushback from tech giants. And this has been the story in every country practically. In Australia, you remember, tech giants tried to hold the country to ransom and threatened a blackout. In Europe, they're engaged in legal cases and routinely slapped with fines. In America, they deplatformed a sitting president. They blocked Republican claims on the lab leak theory as misleading and false. And now a Democrat in the White House is pushing the same theory and tech companies are happy to provide a platform. Do you see what's happening here? Tech companies wield too much power. They try to play above the law. They weaponize their platforms against voices and ideologies that they do not agree with. And let me give you the most recent example. It's from Nigeria. Twitter has removed a post by the president of Nigeria citing violation of rules. Mohamedou Buhari had put out a tweet on a spate of attacks on government offices by protesters. He referred to the Nigerian civil war of 1970. He said those misbehaving today should be treated in the language they understand. Twitter removed the post and restricted Buhari's account, a president's account, to read-only mode. While we do not agree with what he said, he's still the sitting president. And the question is, will they even dare to do such a thing in an autocratic country like China? They won't. They will do the exact opposite. In 2019, and they don't even operate in China, by the way, right before the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, Twitter suspended hundreds of accounts critical of the Chinese regime. When asked why, and you have to listen to this, why did they delete accounts which were critical of the Chinese regime? This is Twitter's response. It blamed an error in its program. Such is the hypocrisy. They claim to be intermediaries, platforms that ensure free and fair conversation, but time and again, they use editorial control to shape narratives, to play judge, to influence opinion through manipulative and selective censorship. Can tech giants be allowed to program our conversations? That's a question that must be asked. We've all heard about arms races. It's basically a contest between countries on who will secure more guns, more missiles, more nukes. America knows a thing or two about the arms race, but here's something that they did not anticipate. An arms race within their own country. This arms race has consequences, human consequences. Let me tell you what happened in Florida this week. Two teenagers ran away from a juvenile home on Tuesday. A 14-year-old girl and a 12-year-old boy, they broke into a nearby home and guess what they found inside? Weapons. And not just any weapons, an AK-47 and a shotgun. Moments later, police arrived. They hid behind the trees, as you see there, and they tried to reason with these children. But the children, were, they were flustered. They did not know what to do. So they opened fire at the officers. And in response, the cops fired back. They hit the girl. And soon after, the boy surrendered. We pieced together the operation using some of the body cam footage. This is how it unfolded. Female has a shotgun in her hand. Stand by. Put the gun down now! Hey, guys, you hold behind hard cover. Let's not shoot. Ten four, they're shooting at me. Hold it, hold the air. Shots fired! God damn it! Shots fired again. Female now has a pistol. Juvenile male has a long gun. So does the female. Stand by. She's pointing the gun. Pointing the gun behind the trash can. Behind the trash can. You guys be careful of your bow marks. She's out there by you guys. <laughs> Central shots fired, shots fired, Elio shots fired. The boy went back inside. Females on the ground behind the car. You got eyes on her? Let's worry about getting her secure. Let me see your hands. right here in the community center. I had them. Get your hands up. Stop talking. 10-3, 10-3, 10-3. Okay. Get up on her. Get up on her. Get up on her. Gray, you get that rifle. Don't reach towards that gun. Step on that rifle. Step on that shotgun. Now take a step back and think about what happened here. A shootout between police officers and 12 and 14 year olds. Thankfully the girl is fine, she underwent surgery, she's stable now, but a dozen things could have gone wrong here. What should have been a house break-in ended up being a shootout. Why? Because the house was an armory. 
It had a handgun, a shotgun and an AK-47. Such operations have become far too common in the U.S. This year, there have been 160 shootings so far, each one claiming at least four lives. Same time last year, there were 90 shootings. So things are getting worse. Who do you blame for this? Joe Biden came to office promising gun control. Since then, his country has seen dozens of mass shootings. What has the president done? The fact is, Americans are obsessed with guns, and this obsession is killing people. We have data to support this. Let me show you numbers from 2019. There were more than 38,000 deaths involving guns. 38,000. A quarter of those cases were homicides. Why is this happening? Because in America, getting a gun is like weekend shopping. Only eight American states have restrictions on buying assault weapons. These are rifles and semi-automatic weapons. Fit for Afghanistan, not a friendly neighborhood in Brooklyn. When you combine a gun obsession with easy access, this is what you get, a gun epidemic. There are more than 390 million guns in America, 390 million. And dominating this trend are a few gun fanatics. Just 3% of America's population owns nearly 120 million guns. Their average collection is 17 guns. Now, unless you're preparing for a zombie attack, 17 guns is overkill. You would need an armory inside your house just to store them. But looking ahead, are these numbers likely to fall? You would think a global pandemic would have dampened the spirits, but no. Americans actually bought more guns in 2020, 17 million guns to be precise. Remember, this was a year with lockdowns, with deaths, racial unrest and a presidential election, but Americans were busy buying guns. This momentum has continued into 2021. The FBI conducted 3.2 million background checks in May. 3.2 million. Now, background checks usually precede a gun purchase. So 3.2 million Americans tried buying guns last month. Fun fact, America's vaccination rate plummeted in the same month. Yes to guns, no to vaccine. This is America. What is the government doing to set this right? Offering guns for jabs, and I'm not making this up, West Virginia has a lottery system for people taking the vaccine. Among the attractive prizes are custom hunting rifles and shotguns. Far from gun control, this is a state actively promoting gun proliferation. So we must ask the question, does Joe Biden have the appetite to take on the gun lobby? No doubt they are a formidable opponent. Last year, gun rights groups spent more than $30 million, all of it on lobbying and advertisements. In contrast, gun control groups spent around $20 million. You see, it's a battle of narratives. The rational voices in America must convince the gun fanatics. But that's easier said than done, and we understand that. Guns have killed four sitting presidents, four sitting American presidents. They kill 30,000 citizens every year. Yet gun rights remain untouchable. Like I said at the start, this is an arms race that America did not expect. And this is an arms race that ends with death and destruction. Is the British royal family racist? In the month of March, Meghan Markle put Buckingham Palace under a spotlight. She said racism had driven her away from the royals, and since then the palace has struggled to recover. Now more explosive allegations have emerged. In the 1960s, apparently, the Queen's staff banned colored immigrants or foreigners from working at the palace. And that's not all. The palace sought exemptions from workplace equality laws. There were laws in Britain that the palace did not apparently follow. And the Queen was exempted by lawmakers for more than four decades. Here's a report. I can give you an honest answer. In those months when I was pregnant, all around this same time, so we have in tandem the conversation of he won't be given security, he's not going to be given a title, and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. Those words shook up England. Meghan Markle claimed that at least one royal had concerns about how dark her son's skin would be. It wasn't the first time that the British royal family faced charges of racism. 
But this time it was coming from within. Now, fresh disclosures from the archives of the palace have revealed institutional racism. At least till the late 1960s, the Buckingham Palace banned ethnic minorities from office jobs. A British newspaper has accessed some documents from the British National Archives. They reveal how those working for the Queen wouldn't allow hiring of colored immigrants or foreigners. They were allowed to work only as domestic servants. Going by the documents, the alleged racism wasn't limited to the Queen's staff. Apparently, the palace actively negotiated for exemptions from laws that would have prevented discrimination on the basis of race and gender. In the 1960s, British lawmakers introduced laws to enable equality at the workplace. But the Queen remained exempted from those laws for more than four decades. In their defense, palace officials said they have records of employees from ethnic minorities since the 1990s. But they didn't say when the ban on minorities ended. This report has only brought the attention back to the royal family's past. British royals have been accused of turning a blind eye to racism. Experts claim the Queen has never apologized for racism by previous monarchs. The Meghan Markle interview revealed that racism still very much exists in the royal family. These revelations from the past will only make the present more difficult for the monarchy. Bureau Report, World is One. What's the most powerful weapon in a war of narratives? Not speeches, definitely not military strength or even personal charisma. The most powerful tool of public opinion is a news headline. It reaches millions of people instantly, it triggers a conversation and these conversations can make a difference. They can end a regime or create a new one, which is why countries are eager to control news headlines. Control the headline and you control the narrative, or so they believe. In Russia, a similar campaign is unfolding. And before we dive into the story, let me give you some background on Russian media. Most of them are state-owned. They operate as mouthpieces of the Kremlin. Reporters Without Borders ranked Russia 150th out of 179 countries. There are very few independent outlets remaining in Russia. These outlets are often harassed. Sometimes their internet connection is snapped. Sometimes reporters are threatened. Moscow's latest weapon is a controversial piece of legislation. It is called the Foreign Agent Law. What is this law? All non-governmental organizations that receive foreign funds must register themselves as foreign agents. This law was passed in 2012. It's not new. And since then, it's been modified multiple times. The latest modification added media houses to the list. Foreign agents, the media. So last month, an outlet called V-Times was declared a foreign agent. You see, the V-Times is actually registered in the Netherlands. So according to the law, it is a foreign agent. But why is this tag a problem? Because it comes packaged with a boycott. Sponsors and advertisers do not want to touch foreign agents. So gradually, these media houses will be squeezed for money. V-Times has seen the writing on the wall. They have decided to wind up publishing by June 12th. For Russia, this is mission accomplished. The foreign agent law has little to do with foreign funding. It's more about crushing dissent, say critics. V Times was one of the last remaining independent outlets in Russia. The rest have been gobbled up by the state or pro-Kremlin oligarchs. The editors at V Times say they know this very well. They wrote a scathing statement while announcing the decision to wind up. And here's a quote from that. Essentially, V-Times is being pushed into the niche of opposition political media, but we conceived and made a completely different publication. Therefore, we decided to stop publishing V-Times on June 12th, the Independence Day of Russia. So it wasn't just about the money for them. Foreign agents are vulnerable to imprisonment. V-Times would have had to weigh each word they wrote, and that simply wasn't an option for them, so they decided to shut it was better to shut down than operate in fear. And this is not an isolated story. Last month, a popular Russian paper called Medusa 
was labeled a foreign agent. Radio Free Europe met a similar fate. What is Russia's justification for this crackdown? Moscow calls it an eye for an eye. You see, Russia is not the only country that labels media houses as foreign agents. The United States does it too. Did you know this? Though you could say it is reserved for state-owned outlets like China's Global Times, but the United States and the European Union have condemned the foreign agent law. It could feature in the talks between Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin. Another issue for the two sides to clash on. The foreign agent law is a tool of oppression. It could effectively end free press in Russia if it hasn't already. A combination of fines and intimidation is pushing media houses out. What remains are the mouthpieces we talked about, and they cannot be trusted to do real journalism. Let me give you an example. This is what the editor-in-chief of a state-owned channel tweeted last month. I never thought that I would envy Belarus for anything, but now I'm jealous in a way. Lukashenko played it beautifully. This was a journalist openly supporting last month's plane diversion, or hijacking, have some have called it, as some have called it, not just supporting, I should say praising an act of aerial piracy. And this sums up the shrinking media space in Russia. President Vladimir Putin has dropped the pretense of encouraging a free press with elections around the corner. He wants to control the narrative. Leashing the media is key to his plans for an eternal presidency. The elephant is no match for the dragon. This is an ana analogy that the Chinese have often used to threaten India every time the two countries have been at odds. Now China, for all its tall claims of being the dragon, is struggling to control a herd of elephants. This is happening in the Yunnan province where 15 elephants have been on the loose for months and they've wrecked several hectares of crops, drained multiple water tanks and caused $1.7 million in losses already. 15 elephants. It's an embarrassing story of poetic justice for China. Take a look. In ancient Chinese mythology, elephants are a symbol of protection and good fortune. Try telling that to the forest rangers of Yunnan, who've been tracking a herd of 15 Asian elephants since April. During this time, the mammals have drained multiple water tanks, guzzled countless supplies at barns, wrecked around 56 hectares of crops, and caused an estimated $1.7 million in losses. Such a situation has happened for the first time in history and it has never happened before. So everyone is thinking about the reasons. It remains to be further observed and studied. No casualties have been reported, but the elephants are slowly becoming a menace for local authorities. They are walking down urban roads and poking their trunks through windows. Local governments are using roadblocks and tons of food supplies to shift the course of this unstoppable 15. But their efforts are not bearing fruit. The elephants have trekked an epic 500 kilometers to the north. They started from the Shishuang Bana Nature Reserve in the Yunnan province and were last spotted in the periphery of Kunming, the capital of Yunnan. Where exactly are they headed? Well, nobody knows, but the broad consensus is that they're looking for a new habitat. Asian elephants mainly like to live in open forest land, where the forest is not very good. It means that the elephants like the green environment, where the canopy density is not very high. In such an environment, there can be a lot of food that the elephants like to eat. Asian elephants are the most threatened species on the planet. They've been listed as endangered on multiple nature red lists for decades. In China, the species is said to be under first level protection the country's strictest for wild animals. There are only 300 of them in China, mainly inhabiting parts of southern Yunnan. But in recent years, scuffles between elephants and villagers in Yunnan have become increasingly frequent, with reports of crops being destroyed and occasional deaths of villagers. In such times, expeditions like these are quite natural for elephants as they search for a new habitat. But on social media, this gigantic expedition is being romanticized. With Weibo users saying the elephants probably wanted to attend biodiversity conference in Kunming. We would like to add to the trend and say this. 
for China which mocks India constantly by saying the elephant is no match for the dragon. This unstoppable expedition may just be a message in disguise. Bureau report me on World is One. Israel is staring at a change in leadership. After 12 years as Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu could be on his way out. Opposition parties have struck a power-sharing deal. Opposition leader Yair Lapid has assembled what is being called the most unlikely and diverse coalition in a country that has always had a coalition government. Far-right leader Neftali Bennett is tipped to be the next Prime Minister of Israel. Here's a report. Israel's opposition leader and centrist Yair Lapid is moving closer to unseating Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Lapid has officially informed the country's president that he has reached agreements with political allies to form a new government. The dramatic announcement came shortly before a midnight deadline. The deal has prevented the country from plunging into what would have been its fifth consecutive election in just over two years. Lapid's main partner is nationalist Naftali Bennett. Under the agreement, Lapid and Bennett will split the job of a prime minister in rotation. The government of change is a news that so many citizens were waiting for, that Israel needed so much. We still have a long way and the Labour Party will be there all along the way to make sure that things are being done like they should. Tonight, we are starting a new beginning. The agreement still needs to be approved by the Knesset. A vote in the parliament is expected to take place early next week. The Bennett Lapid government won't be sworn until the 14th of June. And that leaves Netanyahu almost two weeks to attempt a turnaround and abort the prospective government by turning lawmakers over to their side and to vote against it. Lapid and Bennett will now most likely try to replace the chairman of the Knesset, which is from the Likud party. If the coalition government goes through, it will end the record-setting 12-year rule of Netanyahu. The announcement sparked tensions between the supporters of Benjamin Netanyahu and his opponents. Outside the negotiation venue, Netanyahu's supporters and opponents demonstrated against a possible government headed by Lapid and Bennett. Another week and a half and there won't be a government voted in the Knesset. Mark my words, another week and a half there will be no government. They will fight with each other and there won't be a government. The alliance has been defiantly condemned by Netanyahu as a fraud of the century. He even warned that if the coalition government comes to power, it would result in a left-wing government dangerous to the security of Israel. The deal has deepened Netanyahu's woes, who's on trial for criminal charges of fraud, bribery and breach of trust while in office. Accusations that he's repeatedly denied. Bureau report, we on, world is one. We live in a cutthroat world, a world of deadlines, a world that is constantly pursuing perfection. The biggest fear is being left behind and this fear makes us do extreme things, not just to ourselves, but sometimes even to our children. Every parent wants their kids to excel, but at what cost? Where does the line of encouragement end and the line of abuse begin? And it is very important to demarcate this line because excessive pressure can be damaging. So what's the playbook here? What is the line that you must not cross as a parent or a teacher? I'll give you an example. These are young kids from China performing on Children's Day. Look closely and tell me, do they look happy to you? Look at the girl, young girl in the middle. She's crying her lungs out and nobody bothers to stop the performance. The dance continues. she is again this time her headdress falls off right in the middle of the dance but once again she soldiered on and there are two ways of looking at this 
one a pat on the back for pushing through and the second what kind of a monster puts children through this child would rather be anywhere but that stage she's in tears her attire is coming apart but the show goes on this is a classic example of pushing too hard we have another one again from the children's day celebration in china this child is almost asleep as you can see dozing off but still playing the drums apparently she was so excited about the show that she did not take a nap and this is all kinds of unhealthy which brings us back to my original question how much can you really or should you really push your child there is no magic number there's no percentage it's all about evolving a strategy over time understanding your child's unique limits and strengths for instance you know your kid is good at football great ask them to try out for the school team which is fine but asking them to score a goal every time is not that is excessive pressure and it doesn't have to be verbal this pressure that parents and teachers tend to put a look of disappointment walking out when your kid is not doing well all of this adds up children notice and all of this can leave a lasting memory on your child which is why experts call for nurturing instead of pressuring how does that work first by responding positively every failure is a chance to get it right the next time that should be the messaging and with each encouragement you will see that your child gets better with each scolding you destroy her confidence so to all the parents watching here are a few tips set realistic goals for your children stop living your lives through them if you did not make the soccer team don't push your child to make it because it does not change history and most importantly make sure that your child is having fun remind them that it's okay to not succeed all the time at the end of the day children are the best judge of their skills you can be an enabler at best not a driver so how do you know if you're pushing too hard there are a few signs say experts like if your child is suddenly scared of school or if she is refusing your help with homework chances are that you're pushing too hard other signs include nightmares change in sleeping patterns or eating habits these are all classic signs of anxiety and depression be on the lookout for them and this is exactly what happens if you push too hard if you keep demanding perfect results your child may abandon the routine altogether you could end up giving your child a self esteem problem and all this does sound terrifying but it's also true in pursuit of excellence parents are themselves becoming a problem so go to google and search how to make my child leave the rest of it blank how to make my child and do you know some of the top suggestions that pop up smart and intelligent learn english study do you know what was missing happy how to make my child happy no one's asking this question that's where we should start the moment your child stops having fun whether in sports or academics you may have pushed too hard so the next time you drop your child off at football practice or maybe a piano lesson don't tell them to score a goal or play beethoven's classics just tell them to have fun with that it's a wrap we leaving you as always with gravitas images thanks for watching Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.